We honor the three of us with uh, Tori's daughter, Zeeland, and my daughter, Radiance, um, got to go to Washington, D.C., and it was uh, October 12th. We spent the day, um, 10 hours, 12 hours? Anyway, 10 hours, um, where there was a gathering that uh, Lou Engel had called um, gathering a, the, the vision was a million esters um, for this moment, who've been raised up for this moment for our nation. Um, and so we, we really felt compelled to go and partner with that. Um, so we joined and it was amazing. We, we met people from all over the place. I mean, there were Brazilian women, pack of Brazilian Baptists, fiery women that <laughs> went there, um, people from Boston, people that had just, a couple that had just gotten hit by the um, hurricane in North Carolina, but felt so compelled that they were to make a 13-hour drive um, just to intercede for the nation, just um, people from out west. Um, it was an amazing gathering uh, of, of people, um, all different streams represented um, as far as speaking, uh, when you looked around the crowd, I mean, there were people were on their face, there was weeping, there was fasting, there was dancing, there was flagging, there were women, there were children, there were men um, of all different ages. It was a, it was a phenomenal time, um, really, really powerful time. Um, yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this, but you can start. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I guess I'll just share real quick why, um, as a member of this body, I decided to go. Um, when I first saw it, it was actually, there was a snippet sent to me by my sister-in-law, um, Melissa, um, which is John's sister. And as soon as I watched that video, I felt, I was hit by the Holy Spirit and I knew that I was supposed to go, but I was supposed to go on the behalf of children. Um, and my daughter is an Esther. And I was like, yes, well, our children are called, but they need a covering. And I have felt that so heavily in being a part of this body and a part of this community. We are called to be a covering for the kids. And um, there's an organization called Do Not Mess With Our Children, all right? And I feel the fire of God. I'm wearing the hat, it's mama bear hat. But there is a spiritual warfare after our kids. And I, if you're not aware, I'm here to tell you this. Um, and this is not to incite fear, because fear is worship of the enemy's camp. So I'm just going to pray over you real quick. Um, God, I just thank you that Elevi has fixed their eyes on Jesus. We do not partner with fear against the enemy's camp, but we fix our eyes on Jesus, the Savior of the world. Okay, because fear is worship, okay? Fear is worship, and it's really easy to fear in this day and age as a parent. As a mom of a girl, it's easy to fear. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you, that's an open door. So as I was in this, <laughs> as I was in this conference, I, I do believe I was delivered of a spiritual attack that has been against, um, our, I think just our nation, there has been open doors that our nation have allowed. Um, killing babies is one of them. I'm just going to say it. And it, it has opened the door to kids, and I'm going to tell you, you have to teach your kids how to warfare. And there was a declaration that one of the kids wrote is that their moms would teach them how to put on the armor of God. Okay, I felt that so strongly that as a body, I needed to learn how to do this to equip five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds how to fight the fight of faith, but not in their own strength because it's only by the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you guys, if you do not think the Holy Spirit's needed, repent. Because <laughs> it's not enough to be a good parent right now. The Holy Spirit has to baptize our children. Okay, we can give them all the rules in the world, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is going to get their heart centered on Jesus. And I, I, I do believe I'm standing in the gap for the kids in our area, the kids in my household, the kids I, I love dearly because I love kids that aren't my own. Um, but the mama bear is out. Okay, because there are spiritual airways. And even if our kids are exposed to something, Satan is enough.
to, to speak a lie. And I, I, I think it's hard for us to realize because we, we set up all these boundaries, right? No, you don't watch that TV. No, you, you, I'm going to watch what you're doing. But it's not enough. It's only by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, prayer and fasting. That'll do some deliverance. I believe it did some deliverance in my own life. I'm in this conference. I really felt like I was led there for, for Zeeland, specifically my daughter, because I was like, there's a call on her life. And um, I have to learn how to, how to put on her armor in this, in this world. Um, so I am 30 minutes in. Guys, I'm fasting. Okay. I should be able to fast until 10 o'clock. Right? That's just weird. I like Miss Breakfast a lot, especially as a nurse. Um, so I am on my face. It's 10 o'clock. I've been there for 30 minutes. I feel so sick. I look at my friends, and I think to myself, do I let them know I feel so sick right now? And I'm like, nah, it'll go away. Jesus, thank you. My eyes are fixed on you. Mind you, earlier that day, I was just like telling the Lord, I'm like, I'm fasting for you. And immediately he said, no, you're fasting for you. I was like, okay. <laughs> and people think they sacrifice for Jesus. I'm telling you, nothing is a sacrifice for Jesus. It's all his. You're his. You're his. Nothing is a sacrifice for Jesus. So I am fasting. He's like, it's for you, sweetie. So I am on my face. I get hit so heavy. I start vomiting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is not glorious. <laughs> but it's phenomenal because I feel delivered from fear over my children over my future children, come on. So <laughs> I start vomiting nonstop, like I can't function. I am walking three steps, then <clears throat> people are like, Jesus, we thank you that the curses are broken over her. I'm like, yeah, bring it on, bring on the prayers, come on. I'm like, I wanna be delivered. I wanna be delivered because it's not okay to fear. It's not okay to fear. We are worshiping Jesus and fear says, your God isn't big enough. <laughs> I can't do that. I know I look crazy. It's okay. Um, so anyways, I'm like, all right, this is going to go away, right? It doesn't. I am like, it starts coming out the other end. I was like, all right, deliver me, Lord. I didn't know if this was deliverance or what. I was like, are this a spiritual attack? I'm, I'm probably, I, I was probably delivered of fear. So um, this guy's like, I'm going to bring you to the medic tent. I was like, amen. So they, they bring this wheelchair out to me. I, I kid you not. And they're like, you can sit in this. I was like, okay. <laughs> and they're like going over this gravel. It's really ridiculous. I'm like 30 years old. I'm 30 years old. I'm like in a wheelchair. They're like going over these bumps. And I was like, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so they bring me into the medic tent. I am the only one who's vomiting. And probably, I, I don't know, there was a nosebleed in there. I can say that because I wasn't being a nurse. I was patient. Um, so I am in this tent, and um, I just can't function. They give, me, um, they give me an IV. They give me an IV bag. They give me two doses of Zofran. The, the paramedic slips me some more Zofran. He's like, you're a nurse. You can, you can dose yourself, right? I was like, yeah, yeah, please. Um, and I fall into a sleep. And I wake up, and I'm actually really close to where the... Um, presentations going on and I actually wake up to this part where it, they are speaking against the spirit of Ishtar um, and I am not one of those people that glorify the enemy's camp I really well except with fear because you think that's good somehow um, but there was just a realization that I was there for that reason that there is a spiritual warfare against our kids especially the spirit of Ishtar Ashtoreth which this sounds like crazy talk I know but um there are really um there are demons that have been worshipped for ages um and when as a nation we make certain choices we welcome them and I, I'm going to tell you, there's a type of warfare that I didn't know that I would have to engage in over our kids. But I'm willing, and my eyes are going to be fixed on him <laughs> as the author and perfecter of our faith. And over our kids' lives, man, it's the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, Zeeland can't look at me as I con am concerned. She needs to look at me as my eyes are fixed on Jesus. Because I'll tell you, when you look somewhere, other people look where you're looking. Okay, my daughter's going to be trained to look where I'm looking. I will not fear, right? 
So I'm in this camp, camp. It's like a tent. And like, I'm giving them advice because I'm a nurse. I was like, just hang it on, just, just hang it. I'll just take it. I'll just take that IV bag. So I'm like going to the bathroom and I'm like going out the other end, holding my IV bag above. And I'm like, ah! Jesus, you're good. Jesus, you're good. Free me. Free me. And my friends, oh my gosh, guys, I've got great friends. These aren't my only two friends, but they are pretty awesome because they're like, you'll, you'll be okay. <laughs> Jesus is with you, and we're going to go pursue the kingdom of God. <laughs> I was like, I'm okay. <laughs> so I'm going to try to wrap this up because it's kind of a silly story, but um, I end up being in there for five hours. And at one point, the guy's like, you're 80% on your way to eat the ER. I was like, bring it down to 50, okay? Bring it down to 50, because I, I can't go to the ER. Um, that's not what it came for. I live there sometimes, and I don't want to be there. And um, I get out, and it's communion. And I really wanted communion. And I got to hear Papa Bill Johnson. Man, I, I like cried as soon as I heard his voice. I was like, Papa Bill, oh, you're right. Um, and I just got to commune with the Lord and it was a struggle because I thought it would hit again, the wave of sickness that I just overcame. And I'm like, I'm not being wise. I'm like texting John, John, set me up an Uber. I think I'm going to Uber myself out so that they can stay at the, guess what? My phone shuts off. He sets up an Uber. I can't find the Uber and my phone dies. I was like, all right, Jesus, I'm here no matter what happens. Um, and so I feel still terribly sick. And we get to um, towards the end, <laughs> and we're walking. And I'll tell you, it felt like heaven because there's people on both sides of us worshiping Jesus, flagging, and there's worship in the background. And I t there's this, like, fire lane, so it looks like a hallway between masses of people who are serving the Lord. And I'm walking down, and I feel so sick. And it gets to the part where Jonathan Kahn brings out the altar. And I was like, oh, Jesus, this is why I'm here. So there was a breaking of the altar of the spiritual god, Ishtar. I know this sounds weird. This sounds weird. But, guys, for prophetic people, this makes total sense. It's called a prophetic act. They bring the altar out, and they kind of made a replica of one of the altars that were used back in the Ancient of Days or whatever. I, I don't know. Ancient of Days is probably not the right term. <laughs> Correct that. <laughs> the, the ancient times. How about that? Um, and they break the altar. And I, I was like so weak and so sick, but I was like, God, I got to be a part of this moment. Zeeland was present for this. And um, I, I know that this spiritual act like, is echoing through eternity. And one thing that I'm walking away with is some authority. I have some authority. I'm a daughter of the king, and I'm not looking to pick battles with the enemy, but I'm looking to pray over your children that they would have a baptism in the Holy Spirit and experience with the one true God. Yeah. So, amen. That's why we went. That's why I went. Yeah, wow. I was kind of like just praying about what to share. I don't know that I know yet, um, but God knows. Oh, just pray for God. So, um, yeah, I feel like the Lord has been highlighting fire. Um, fire. So I'm just going to read the perfect word of the Lord because that's the best thing to do. Um, Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Hallelujah. Whoa. So, wow, we've got to pray for each other. Um, we must pray for each other. Um, wow, because the fire of God is not safe, um, but it is so good. We must live in the fire of God. 
I'm becoming more convinced of this, um, and I need this. I so desperately need this. And I feel like um, there is such a tender um, place right now. I feel like there's such a tender place um, for repentance, like the gift of repentance being poured out. To make space for glory, to make space for the fire. Hallelujah. That you are, we are living sacrifices, burning, burning, burning with God in God for a sweet fragrance to him. He will burn up all of the chaff. Whoa, he is going to burn it up and he will give his grace to expose idols in our lives. That they will be burned up. We must stay in his fire. Um, so wow, we, um, he loves us so much. Um, so there was, while we were there, there was, um, opportunity for like corporate repentance, which is so good. Um, repentance over bitterness, uh, holding on to, to trauma, to, from being, holding on to trauma and being trauma inflictors, um, Repentance over sexual immorality in every way. Repentance of, um, of, you know, um, there there was re reconciliation. Was the opposite of reconciliation, dissension, um, discord. Repentance over that. Um, so that was definitely highlighted to me, um, you know, and uh, just an increase of the fear of God. Um, to bring the fire. So, um, and then at the very end, the other thing that was highlighted to me was we got to take communion together. And um, one testimony was a man that I think was in Japan or something was worshiping the Lord and he had a vision. And he said, whenever the blood of Jesus was mentioned, the heavenly beings would fall prostrate to the ground. And he started engaging with the Lord. He said, why do the heavenly beings fall prostrate? The name, the mention of the blood of Jesus. And he said, it is only on earth that we do not fall prostrate. The mention of the blood of Jesus and so I was just like, that was moved by that. I would need to soak in that. I need further, we need, we need further revelation of the blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus is so precious. It is the most powerful thing. It is the most powerful thing. And if we stay in the covering of the blood of Jesus, well, that's where we need to stay. Right there, right there right there. We cannot heal ourselves. We cannot heal ourselves. We claim the blood of Jesus. He will heal us. He will make us clean. The fire of God, the holiness of God, the mercy of his fire, the mercy of his blood will make us clean. So, um, so that is kind of, uh, the, the highlights for me. Thank you for being with us in the spirit. I really felt we were there together. Um, we are one. So good to be one. And so I think that's all I'm supposed to share maybe for right now. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, wow, that's so good. So you can see kind of the fruit of um, what God's doing right now on, on the earth. You've got ones who are being called with this mama bear. I'm going to intercede and stand in the gap for the children. You've got ones who are just in this place of um, just uh, standing in the gap by way of repentance and just that kind of move. You see the difference? Um, and that which is really awesome. I feel like we experienced that uh, at that gathering um, and so really, I'd say, like, <laughs> we're all part of this movement, so we have to ask the Lord, what is our posture? What is he asking us to do to be part of this? Um, and just being sensitive to that, and that's going to look really, really different. For me, I'll tell you, um, uh, Tori asked, she was like, do you want to go? And I was like, 
wow, of course I want to go. And she's like, let's bring Z and Radiance. And I was like, immediately, I was just like, wow. <laughs> like, all I just saw in a flash of light is just millions of people and my five-year-old daughter. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that is like anxiety and panic, because I'm all in. I'm an intense woman. And so it's like, I know I'm going to get all in, um, but I've got a five-year-old daughter that I'm going to be like, where is she at all times and stuff. And so I was like, wow, Lord. Um, but I'm like, I love Tori and I trust her. And so I'm just like, okay, I'm going to ride this out. There was one morning we were at Epic and I said, I was like, okay, we had to make a decision. And I was like, Lord, I need you to speak. I need you to tell me like, like, I'm all about a really good idea, and it, like I love the adventure, so I'm pretty much always gonna <laughs> be like, "Yeah, sign me up," you know. But I was like, "I need, I need a word from you." So we come into our cave time with the, with the kids, and one of our intercessors for the school comes out, and he's like, "I was interceding this morning, and I saw this picture," and he was like, "I feel like I'm supposed to give you the picture, but I have no idea what it means." And it was a sledgehammer, but it had two handles. Whoa. So we come into cave time. And, you know, we had a little bit of a, of, of a, of an, I mean, we're, we've been talking about the, the kingdom and the kingship of Jesus, trying to meditate, revelation of his kingship. And um, Kev says to me, he's like, I feel like we're supposed to invite the kids into this. So we, 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 we asked the kids, we say, you guys, hey, one of our, one of our intercessors got this picture. Let's ask the Holy Spirit what this means. So, uh, so we spend some time asking the Holy Spirit, and they begin to write down what they think, and they post it up, and, and, and we're, we're looking at these, and, and they're saying, you know, it, it's partnership with the Holy Spirit. People are, you know, we are, we are part of this for the breakthrough. Um, one of them are like, they need two, um, two hands to bring breakthrough. Partnership with the Holy Spirit. Partnership with the Holy Spirit. And I, I, got, I got the scripture, Joel 2.16. So I w looked at that, and I was like, what on earth does that say? It says, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes. And I knew in that moment that for me, it's, it's a gathering of the children along with us because they are a vital part of this movement. And so I was like, yes, even though my five-year-old will not be able to comprehend this, and I'm not going alone. I'm taking these children <laughs> that God has entrusted with us, with us, because they are part of this breakthrough. And this is cool because this is the, a picture that Radiance drew this morning, and I was like, this is it. And you might not be able to see it, but it's a bu bunch of mountains, big mountains and little ones, big mountains and little ones. And together, the big mountains and the little ones, we create a fortified city, right? And so I, <laughs> yeah. So then we began to steward that. All right, guys, if we're going to this, you know, and, and the kids, like, how do, we, how do we steward this? How do we learn to pray? How do we learn to declare and decree? And so they, um, and I'll set, we'll make this all available to you. Um, they came up with declarations and decrees that are powerful, that will change the face of our nation if we declare that. These kids from kindergarten through eighth grade um, came up with this. And uh, they've been praying. We pray through worship, and, 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 and we're just declaring, and we're decreeing. You know, we're doing prayer stations covering all realms of government, school, like everything with the kids, trying to train them up to, um, to be part of this movement. That's where my heart beats um, for this. And I'll tell you, uh, when I got home, as a family, we actually looked at um, bits and pieces of the assembly. It's online. It's over 10 hours, but I... I I actually encourage you to watch that because if you are like, I don't really know exactly how to pray or you're like been afraid, like I've been afraid to like where I'm going to get my information from because I'm like, I don't want to get like wrong information from sources and stuff. But this was so well done. I encourage you to use it as a, as a platform to direct you in how to pray because they go over issues and they'll first lead the body of Christ through repentance in us so that we can stand in the gap and walk in authority. And so it's so beautifully done. It will be a prayer guide for you to know. Um, plus, it's incredibly informative um, by prophetic voices that are really tapping in and dedicating their life. So we as a family actually um, listened to snippets over it over the week afterwards. And we would, we would listen and then we would pray. And then we would, the next night we would listen to another snippet and we would pray. And my boys were like, I had no idea. I had no idea that this was happening in our nation. It was eye-opening. And same. 
I mean, we know we have problems, but I fully uh, invite you to go into that and pray. Um, just look, listen to bits and pieces of it and, and pray with that. We'll also send Lori some links. Um, this organization, Do Not Mess With Your Kids, or Don't Mess With Our Kids, um, has has put out prayer guides, so we're using that at Epic, um, which just teaches you, I mean, kind of helps you partner with um, how to pray for different things. Um, they have it for six and under, for, for you know, the six over six-year-olds, and then for adult prayer guides. So there are um, things that we can send you. We'll also make available the declarations that the kids at Epic made um, for you, uh, and then there's a real specific prayer um, for the next 12 days, I think it is, um, on how to partner with that. Because um, it's great to be praying alone, but to pray in this unity. And I think that's the beauty of it is, is at Epic, you know, you guys are leading your kids at home and, and how to do that. But there's something God's doing with the, with the, with the assembly of the body of Christ. He's breaking off an independence that we go, oh, well, I'll just pray by myself. I don't need to go to the worship night and pray. I'll just pray by myself. No, no, no. Like we need to gather and we need to get under headship and flow with how God is flowing. And so teaching the kids that, he, that you can pray at home, you can pray on your own, you can pray wherever, but when God's gathering a corporate assembly, there's a, an expression of that that is sacred and holy and not to be dismissed and be like, well, I don't feel like going, I got other things to do. Like, we got stuff to do right now, <laughs> right now until he dismisses us from that. So, um, so I'll end on this. So I was like, okay. You know, check, went to that, I get home, you know, and 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 Radiance and I are crashed out on the on our recliner. And I mean they were phenomenal. The girls were i I'll tell you what, when you bring your kids, there was a grace. They were woken up so early, sleep deprived, like get, ran around. We had one thing, one fun thing for them <laughs> that day. One fun thing, and it was to go to the Smithsonian Zoo. Um and we prayer walk through that city. Oh, three miles, you know, over three miles we walk. We're having a fantastic time, only to get to the zoo gates, and they were closing. And <laughs> our kids did not even, and then we're like, oh, now we have to walk three, over three miles back <laughs> to Union Station to get there. They didn't even wince. They had such a glorious time. Ten hours. Have you ever tried to gather your children just for like 20 minutes or something to just kind of soak or just be still before the Lord for even five minutes? Like, trust me, you come into cave time anytime you want and see that some days, unless the Holy Spirit is there, um, it's like it's like squirrels. But they they were phenomenal. The grace of God was on them, showing us they are perfectly capable of being part of this movement. So we were resting on the on the chair. And we are sleeping, and I feel like I'm going in and out of sleep. This has only happened a couple times in my life. But I felt like the Holy Spirit was so there, and he's, like, waking me up out of the sleep. And I'm, like, kind of like, oh, I want to sleep. And he's waking me up. And I wake up to, so what are you going to do now? How are you going to bring the kids into this movement? And that's the question that I'm woken up to, and I'm like, wow, okay, that wasn't a just check that off the list, like, okay, what next, you know, kind of a thing. It's now like, okay, how are we going to bring the children into this movement to be part of this breaking down of altars? Because God, when there's things happening, God has always been faithful to raise up a remnant. And so there is a remnant being raised up, and the children are part of that remnant um, and a really active part of that. So I'm going to leave you on this. A um, couple more pictures that the kids were drawing just this morning. Um, so arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. So this is such a good hour. We just speak that over the body, um, that, that we are arising and shining. We are no longer sleeping. We are no longer dormant, um, but we are arising and shining and taking taking this nation back um, for the kingdom of God. We cannot unsee what we have been told. We're going to steward it faithfully and well. And then um, Z drew this one, and it's beautiful. You can't see it, but it's got a little trellis above it and a heart. And so it just made me think of the bride of Christ that's arising right now. So we just declare over us that we are a bride of Christ. We don't carry an orphan spirit. We know our bridegroom. We're carrying the spirit of the bride with her groom in this hour and bringing the glory and the fireworks and the fire <laughs> um, and the promises of God back into our nation. And we will not relent until it happens. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, let's just grab a hand right now. Let's just seal this in prayer. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just call this moment a holy moment, a solemn assembly, Lord, of your people. Father, we know that this world is a mess. It's upside down and inside out. It's scrambling to try to find a place to land. And Jesus, you said that we are the light of the world. You said it so many times this morning. You are, we are the hope. You have put your trust in your church to be the hope of the world. And Father, we are in an hour, especially in this nation and in the world, where things are held in the balance. There are tipping points. Lord, there are crossroads ahead of us. And Father, I thank you for the momentum in the spirit right now. Lord, this is not a person's agenda. This is the heavenly agenda. This is not a political agenda. This is not a religious agenda. This is not somebody trying to trump somebody else's belief system. This is about the king of kings having the voice in the earth, that the earth belongs to the Lord and the fullness thereof, that God as creator of all things has the only opinion that matters. And Father, we thank you for these three women who went on our behalf and the, and the two kids who went on our behalf, Lord, to stand in that holy assembly of people, hundreds of thousands of people and millions around the world who were confessing and declaring that the kingdom of God is among us. So, Father, let us not lose this hour we're in. Let us not turn a blind eye. Let us not stick our head in the sand. But, Father, let us sh throw our shoulders back. Father, we are not those who shrink back, but we are those who stand, not in our own righteousness, not in our own crafty ideas, but in the decrees from heaven that all of the earth will see the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, ladies. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being there on our behalf. Amen. Amen. Yes. I'm just going to share a few minutes. I just want to continue to hammer in what God has been hammering into us, and we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer, and we're at that point. Great segue, great transition. The only part we haven't looked in that prayer is lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. That doesn't mean that God is leading anybody into temptation. If you really want to look at the way that we should understand this, is lead us, but not into temptation. In other words, don't let us be stupid. Don't let us head in the direction of our temptations. Don't let us walk in the directions of our own thinking and our own thoughts and our own righteousness. Keep us from doing that. And then Jesus said, pray that he would deliver you from evil. But the real understanding, what Jesus really said in the Greek, is deliver us from the evil one. God does not want to take us out of the evil. He wants us to be delivered from the evil one who is the instigator of all this evil. The word evil in the Greek means what causes pain. We, we call something in our body that causes pain a disease. That prefix dis means to pull apart, to break asunder, to break into pieces. That there is an evil one that creates and inflicts pain and the pain is a result of being separated from the love of God, being separated from the grace of God, being separated from the word of God, being separated from the reason that you and I were created. The God of this world, Jesus called him. Paul said the God of this world, the prince of the air, has blinded the eyes of those who are making decisions, those who are living in a world, those who are living according to their own understandings. There is an evil in the world that God has left us in the world to do something about. So Jesus never said, keep them away from evil. He said, don't let them be delivered into the hands of the evil one. In other words, if you and I are going to go astray, no matter where it is, if we are disconnected from God, then there's going to be dis-ease in our hearts and our minds and our bodies. And that dis is going to create this longing for something. And then the evil one, the one who creates and inflicts pain, is going to have an artificial whatever. You don't need God. Just take this. You don't need this, I'll give you this. So how did Jesus expect his people? How did Jesus deal with evil? Next week I want to unpack this a little bit as we are going into probably the, the most critical election period in our nation's history, I believe. And I, I'm not saying that lightly, I'm just saying morally, spiritually, the direction we're heading, 
there has to be a course correction. And let's be honest, there is no such thing as a right candidate. Everyone is flawed. Look at the person next to you and ask them to tell you you're flawed. <laughs> We're all flawed. None of us are able to do it right. So don't look at what's happening in the world right now as picking the lesser of two evils. Look at it as lessening evil. Turning the course of something. We have to turn the course. We are not depending on a political system. We're not depending on an earthly government. But there are systems in place on this planet that God has given authority to. And when that authority is disconnected, remember, dis-ease, that word dis means to disconnect. When authority is connected to God, there's righteousness. When authority is disconnected, there's unrighteousness. Whether the person who does the disconnecting knows it's unrighteousness is not the issue because they may be blind to the fact that they're heading down the wrong path. But when God opens our eyes, when we begin to see, now we have to reconnect what we're doing to God's government. So we're not choosing the lesser of two evils. We are choosing to lessen evil by changing the course. And these three ladies shared about a group of people who believe that it starts with understanding the war that we're in. Deliver us from evil is spiritual warfare. Do you realize that voting is spiritual warfare? That we live in a democratic republic where there's not only a right, but there's a responsibility that comes with being a citizen of this country, that your voice matters. How many remember this, this, this saying, the only thing necessary for evil to flourish is for righteous men or good men to do nothing? Well, I looked up that quote, and there's more to it than that. Uh, that, that was actually a condensed version that became popular. But listen to the whole thing. This is from the mid-1800s by a man named John Stuart Mill. He said, Let not anyone pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part or forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. He is not a good man who, without protest allows wrong to be committed in his name and with the means with which to help to supply because he will not trouble himself to use his mind on the subject. That's pretty powerful. We need to trouble our minds and be honest of where we are. We are plop dead center in an evil culture. Half of it knows it and the other half doesn't. It's not a matter of recollection, I mean recognizing, it's a matter of understanding. When Peter preached that sermon on Pentecost, he said, deliver yourself from this crooked generation. Crooked generations have been since Adam and Eve left the garden. The first act of two brothers resulted in a murder. The disconnector from truth is still disconnecting from truth. Spiritual warfare is the understanding of how we manage truth. Because we can get off into the weeds in spiritual warfare where everybody says, well, I'm not going to start doing that stuff because that's kind of weird, heady stuff. Spiritual warfare is understanding the ministry of truth in a culture that's broken. How did Jesus deal with evil? Well, there's four ways he dealt with it. One was with the devil directly. Lead us not into temptation. In other words, you and I do not need to face the devil face to face. That's not spiritual warfare. That's stupid. You and I are not designed to rail against Satan. The word of God is, not you, not me. Jesus, his weapon of choice was it is written. Jesus, in human form, was showing us the beginning of spiritual warfare, the beginning of dealing with evil, is managing the word. And if the word of truth is not in your heart and in your head, it's never going to come out of your mouth. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. So Jesus defeated those temptations. He defeated those attempts that were reminiscent of the garden. Jesus was able to defeat it with truth. He didn't rely on smarts. He didn't rely on hand-to-hand -hand combat. He didn't curse the devil. He didn't pull the devil down and tear him apart. He just said it is written. So Jesus dealt with the devil, Matthew chapter 4 and Luke 4, through the word. 
How did he deal with demons? He cast out demons with a word. Now, it doesn't mean a single word. It just means the word of truth. Jesus destroyed the work of the devil through truth. Through truth. And if we don't understand what truth is, we can have arguments all day long about what is subjective truth. And we are in a culture now where you just put truth out there and you're going to get a thousand different answers. And if you say there's absolute truth, you're going to be shot. But Jesus was not afraid to confront what was happening with absolute truth. It is written. God has spoken. There were two other ways that Jesus dealt with evil throughout his ministry. And this is where he left us to pick up where he left off. One is deception and the other is doctrine. And I'm not talking about just religious stuff. I'm talking about doctrine. It's doctrine is a, a thought process of how you get from point A to point B. It's a logical process. It's putting line upon line. It's building things. Doctrine is an understanding of how to walk out truth. Jesus had to deal with the deception and the doctrines of his day. His ministry, his purpose, his main focus was the doctrine and deception of the religious leaders and the political leaders of his day. And he left off, where he left off is where we need to pick up. Turn to John 17. I'm just going to read this and just share a few things. This is the last prayer that Jesus prayed for his church, for his disciples. They watched him kick out demons like rag dolls. He didn't jump up and down. He didn't curse them. He didn't yell. He spoke the word. And his confidence in the word was so high because he was the living word of God. Our confidence level can't be in how much we know. It has to be in who we know. It has to be, as Angie said, the blood of Jesus declares that the war is over that your authority rests not in who you are, it's who he is and what he has done. And the enemy knows it. The book of James says the enemy knows, the demons know this, and they tremble at the thought that you would know it. You realize that? That the demons, the ones who are working with the evil one to inflict pain, know that if you and I get the revelation, they have no power. But yet we argue back and forth because we are powerless because we don't have the word in us and the word is not transforming us. And if the word is not transforming us, we become like Acts chapter 19 deliverance story where this guy saw Paul casting out demons with a word like Jesus was. So he said, what a great idea. I think I can make some money doing this. So he went into this house where this man was demon possessed. And the demon looks at the man who was doing this and said, I know Paul. I know Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And that is the question the enemy is asking. Do you know who you are in the word? Do you know what the word says about who you are? And the demons tremble that we would understand who we are because all it takes is a word to deal with the evil one. All it takes is a word to deal with the demonic. But what does it take to deal with deception and doctrine? It takes truth. And we can't defeat the enemy without truth. So listen to this from John 17. This is his last prayer, that public prayer that he prayed that was recorded. And I'm going to read from verse 11. I am no longer in the world. In other words, I'm leaving. But you are in the world. And I am coming to you, meaning the Holy Spirit. I'm leaving the planet physically, but I'm coming to you in spirit through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the word of truth. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. He will remind you of all that Jesus said. He will teach you all the things that Jesus taught. I'm leaving. You're staying. Don't you love that? I'm out of here. Come on, Jesus, take us with you. And how many believers over the, over the course of the last number of centuries, Jesus, get us out of this mess. Take us home. And it says, I gave you everything you need. I gave you my word, and I gave you my spirit. Now, I'm leaving, but you're staying. I don't think that was very encouraging to them. <laughs> Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me. In other words, your name that you sealed me in, the name that got me in so much trouble. Do you realize how much trouble Jesus got into for calling God his father? Do you realize how much trouble you are going to get into if you start declaring that God is the father of all, that God is a creator, that God is in charge, that God is the one who makes and, and calls all the shots? You know how much trouble you can get into? 
He's telling them, basically, you're in for it. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them that not one of them will be lost except the son of destruction, which was Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled as it was prophesied there'd be one who would betray Jesus. But now I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your... I have given them your... I have given them your word. Jesus, how did you do it? The word. How did you defeat the devil? The word. How did you cast out devils? The word. How did you heal sicknesses? The word. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 8, it goes back to Jesus healing all these people, and then Matthew relates it all the way back to a prophecy in Isaiah that said that he would heal all of our diseases, diseases. Remember, the evil one, evil, pain, to be disconnected, to have dis-ease. He would heal all your diseases. How? Through the word, the word of God living in them, the word of God given to them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Not of the world does not mean not in the world. The word of there. And there's other times when Jesus was talking to Pilate, which we're going to see in just a second. Of means or originating. They don't originate from the world. If you are born again, you no longer originate from this world. You may have originated from the womb of a human being, but you are a spiritual being now, recreated in Christ. You are no longer of the world. You were born in heaven. You were born again. So you're not of the world, but Jesus said, I'm going to keep you here. I'm going to keep you here for a purpose. You are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world. Oh, man. But that you would keep them from the evil one. I am not asking you to keep them away from evil. I'm asking you to keep them away from the evil one because if they start running after the evil one, guess what's going to happen? Guess what happens when you think that you can take on the evil one all by yourself? Ask Eve. Ask Adam. Ask all those who have gone before us who didn't think they needed the covering of the word and the power of the spirit. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. I'm not asking you to keep them away from evil because what the enemy has done is created a world filled with disses. 1 John 3.8 says this. The Son of God appeared for this, re this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil, to destroy dis-ease. The Son of God appeared to destroy dis-ease. Keep that in your mind. Listen to this next sentence. I am not of the world. I did not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. The word sanctify means to set apart for a purpose. Jesus is leaving the disciples on this planet. He's left us here on this planet. He hasn't raptured us out of the mess that I was told was going to happen when I was 12 years old, before I got out of high school, and many times pre after that. He said, don't take them out of the world. Leave them here to do finish what I started, to destroy the works of the enemy, to destroy the dis-ease to destroy the disconnect that people have in their relationship with God. Sanctify them. Set them apart with truth. Your word is truth. Where do you find the truth? If it's not written, you're not going to find it. If it's written, you're going to find it and you're going to understand that the revelation of it, how you apply it. Right now, we don't need opinions. We don't need arguments. We don't need something that can be bigger or better than something else. We need truth because the word truth literally means what is real. When Pilate and Jesus are having a discussion before his crucifixion, Pilate had the power to release him. 
And he said, don't you realize to Jesus, don't you realize I have the power to either release you or condemn you? And Jesus said, you think you do. You're acting as a governmental official in this world, but you don't have anything that God hasn't given to you. And he said, well, you were king. That's what they're accusing you of. And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And that has become the escape hatch for many Christians. To disengage from what's happening around us. To disengage from involvement. To disengage from being responsible. Do you realize that if evil flourishes, it's not because evil is so bad, it's because good people are so apathetic. Thank you, Lord. The big bad evil one has been defeated. We don't need to worry about the evil one because the evil one will continue to do what we allow him to do. We're not looking at the fruit, we're looking at the roots. And many times we start lopping off fruit and forget about the roots. The roots of evil are disconnection from God. That's the beginning of it. When Adam and Eve disconnected in the garden, all the evil fruit began to manifest in humanity. Jesus came to reconnect, to break the dis off and bring us back into that place of ease. The word ease means lack of pain or peace. He came to bring peace. Romans chapter 5 says that now we have peace with God. Peace. No longer dis-ease, but ease. Not easy, but ease. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom doesn't originate here, but there is a kingdom here. And as a representative and an ambassador of a kingdom, what is our responsibility? To report back to the king that his world is a mess and ain't nothing going to change it. Beam me up, Scotty. Get me out of here. And then the message comes back from heaven. I prayed that the Father would not take you out of here until you do something about the evil. Uh, why? Because the word of truth is at stake. Truth is the issue. The reason that we have other issues, the fruit of lack of truth, is all the other issues that we're fighting for. But if you just cut off the fruit, what happens? Jesus said you know a bad tree by its fruits because its roots are rotten. We're not talking about just going after issues. We have to start there. But we're talking about going after the root of the problem, which is truth. And if there's no truth, there's always going to be rotten fruit. But let me just finish this. Where am I? Verse 16. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. How are you going to get out of that one? As you have sent me. How did God send his own son into the world? For what reason? The, word, the phrase as means to imitate or do exactly the same. Jesus is praying this prayer that he, the Father would do exactly the same for his disciples that he did for them. That he would send his disciples into the world in the exact same way with the exact same mission that he was sent into the world. So we are to be sent into the world not just to preach the gospel, so to speak, but to establish truth. Paul said the church of Jesus is the pillar of truth. In other words, if truth is going to be told, it's going to be told through the mouthpiece of the church, which is the mouthpiece of Jesus, because the Holy Spirit says what Jesus says. As you have sent me, send them. Not just to build hospitals, that's a fruit of sending not just to bring good news to the hopeless, that's a fruit of sending, but to establish truth, what is real. And if we don't know what is real, we can be tricked and deceived about something is not real. Have you ever seen what AI can do? Do you know some of the ads you watch on social media are AI generated and most people don't even know it? There are all kinds of things that are being generated with all kinds of you know, wow, did you hear? 
Yeah, that was AI. And I'm just saying this. Every time we use AI and tell AI what we don't like or do like, guess what we're doing? We're teaching it. You're teaching it. You're teaching it how to think like a human. So, where does that leave believers? Uh, take us out of the world. Or, let's teach AI how to think like God. I'm serious. If you start using AI to develop things, start using Christian principles. Design me a program that would help me explain this truth to a child. Design me a teaching that would help me explain to somebody who has been hurt by God in the past. And then use scriptures, use sc spiritual principles as pointers and prompts. Watch what happens. AI is going to learn how to think like God. But unless we do something, that's just one example of what it means to go into the world, the world you're in, not the world that we're not in, not the world that was, the world we're in. But many of us are either living in the past or hoping for the future, forgetting here. We are called here now for a reason. And if we don't do and capture this moment, the moment slips out of our fingers. So let me finish this and then we'll close. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for your sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. And here's where you and I come in. I do not ask for these only, but also for all who would believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one, that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one and that's his prayer that is his prayer that we would all be one with him the father the spirit those who have gone before us those who are here now and those who will be here after we're here there is a thread that god is weaving jesus had to deal with the devil he had to deal with demons and the last part of this and how apropos just before an election <laughs> is how to deal with deception, how to deal with doctrines of deception. You know, Peter, I mean, Paul told Timothy, this young pastor in Ephesus, and if you read the book of Acts, chapter 19, you'll see what happened in Ephesus. It was filled with deception. It was filled with magic arts. It was filled with all kinds of the occult. And there was such a great revival that people had this revelation that the path they were on was destruction. So they took all these books and if you add up how much those books cost, probably in today's money, it would be over $5 million worth of books. They burned in the city square because it had such a revelation that that was an error and Paul was preaching truth. Timothy was the pastor. This young kid was a pastor of this church in that community. And here's what he said. I'm paraphrasing it. We're going to look at it next week because it's so important. Realize this, Timothy, that as time goes on, now, for those of you who like to say the last days, it doesn't say the last days because they want to project this as being, see, Paul said this was going to happen. Parents, I mean, kids have always been disobedient to parents. There's nothing new under the sun. Evil has always been evil, and the fruit of evil has always been the same. It just manifests in different ways. But he said, realize this, that as time goes on, people will reject the truth. Now, Paul was living in the first century, and the time he wrote this was probably about 33 or 34 years after Pentecost. Already, there was a rejection of the truth, not just from outsiders, but from insiders, because even the insiders didn't want to surrender their version of the truth for the truth. So Paul said to Timothy, realize this, that as time goes on, people are going to be rejecters of truth. They're going to be mockers of good. And then he goes on in the next verse and he says, they have been deluded by the doctrine of demons. So you don't think that the enemy has a teaching scheme? He has a matrix on how to delude and how to divide and how to bring dis into everything, disharmony. I mean, just in this nation alone, you can't even mention certain words around certain people without a disruption. 
I mean, I remember growing up as a kid looking at political signs on people's lawns and thinking nothing of it. But now you walk past somebody's house and if they have a sign out there that's contrary to the sign that you like, what's the first thought you have to battle? Ugh. How could they? Who are they? Why? Because this has been lured of our hearts and our minds because we don't have truth. We're disconnected. It's like the coupling of a railroad car. If you disconnect it, whatever's behind that disconnect just drifts backwards. And the train could be moving that direction and you're moving in that direction. But he said, realize this, that people will be deluded by the doctrine of demons. How does the church deal with the doctrine of demons? In the church, in the world, and in our own hearts. And then how did Jesus deal with the factions of his day that were supposed to be the bastions of truth? There were many political religious parties of Jesus' day. It was a hotbed of political sewerage. The Roman Empire overlords allowed certain political things and religious things to happen as long as they kept peace. They could care less as long as there wasn't a riot. So there was this milieu of all these different groups in Israel at the time, but the three big dogs were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. And Jesus warned them. And we're going to look at this and unpack this next week because you need and I need to understand how this affects us. Beware and watch, he said. He didn't say look out. He said beware and watch. That means be on high alert for the leaven of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. The leaven. There's leaven in our church in general. There's leaven in us. There's leaven in our culture. There's the evil side of leaven that we need to unpack, but then there's also the positive side of leaven where Jesus compared the kingdom of God to leaven, that a woman took a little pinch of dough, not a packet of yeast, sourdough, little lump, little pinch, and folded it into dough and the whole thing got leavened. There is a leavening agent that's either truth or a lie. You can't have half truth, you can't have half lie. It's impossible. It's either truth or a lie. God has created this beautiful, powerful binary system good and evil, truth or lies. And we need to realize if there's leaven that's a lie, it's going to affect the whole lump. So let's be encouraged that the light of the world is in us, that the word of truth is available. How do you get this in you? You read it. You meditate on it. Isaiah said, or Ezekiel was told to take this scroll and eat it. Eat it, chew on it, swallow it. So we need to let the word of God abide in us because we cannot figure these things out in our own strength. God has equipped us. He's called us. He's empowered us. He left us here to do something about evil. And to do nothing is evil. As a matter of fact, in my book, to do nothing is a greater evil than for the one who's doing it and is deceived. There's no exit door. There's no excuse. If we're not moving towards lessening evil, we're allowing evil to prosper. And that is a sobering thought. Amen? Well, Father, thank you right now that your spirit is moving, that you are working. Lord, that you have destined your church to be the truth tellers. Father, anytime you start telling the truth, you can start an argument. But we're not asking and we're not wanting to start arguments. We're asking for a revelation of truth in our innermost being. So, Father, plant that in us. In this hour, in this culture, the missing ingredient is for the body of Christ to be the representative party of heaven. There's so many political parties on earth vying for power. But Jesus, you said your kingdom has all the power, all the authority. So Lord, we just, again, bow our hearts, bow our heads. We submit to you. 
Father, if we're struggling with our involvement, if we're struggling with issues, if we're struggling with not even wanting to participate, Father, would you just take a hold of the steering wheel and lead us as a body, lead us as individuals to the place where we realize that your voice cannot be heard unless we open our mouth, that truth will not be told unless we tell it, that change will not come unless we're the catalysts. So, Father, we rededicate ourselves to courage. We rededicate ourselves to strength in this hour and going forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So meditate. Read John 17 again. That prayer that Jesus prayed is for us. He said for them and for all who would come in his name, and that's us. So be encouraged. Be built up in strength. Fill your heart and mind with truth in this hour. Amen? Amen. Amen.